Deficits and Debt, Chapter 12. In this chapter, we're going to talk about the budget effects of fiscal policy. Using fiscal policy to solve macro problems implies that federal expenditures and federal receipts won't always be equal. In other words, you're, we're going to have to spend a lot more than we bring in in order to implement uh, fiscal policy, Keynesian fiscal policy. And when you spend more than you bring in, you create a budget deficit. Uh, and that's the amount by which our spending exceeds how much we're bringing in our tax revenue. Keynes's view on budget deficits is that they just happen because when the government intervenes in the economy, you build, uh, you spend more than, than you make and it's okay. Uh, employment and uh, full employment is most important and deficit is very much secondary and shouldn't be a major concern. Two types of spending, discretionary spending and automatic spending. Discretionary spending are the elements of the budget that are not determined by legislative or executive commitments, meaning these are the things that you can control uh, without having to pass laws. Automatic spending, those, those are the elements of the budget that are results made by Congress typically in, pr in prior years that are uncontrollable. Automatic is about 80% of the budget and discretionary about 20% of the budget. So when budget talks come up, if you follow the news and you hear about uh, budget talks and the Republicans and the Democrats battling over the budget, most of what they're talking about is discretionary spending. Because in order to do automatic spending cuts, you're going to have to pass major legislation. Uh, discretionary is something that uh, the president can cut uh, as he executes the budget. Uh, Congress can also put pressure on the president to make certain cuts. And so the, that's typically where the deals are made. Uncontrollable. The president and Congress can repudiate prior commitments and enact new legislation. In other words, they could reduce Social Security, refuse to pay interest, uh, terminate projects, reduce payouts for other for unemployment, Medicare, other things. Uh, and they can do this by fit passing legislation. For example, when the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare was passed, it reduced Medicare payouts. So they reduced Medicare and they of course added other spending when they passed that bill. More spending, uh, as time goes on, we're learning more and more spending, uh, but they reduced Medicare payouts. Uh, whenever you play with these things, whenever you pass legislation to reduce automatic payouts, there's tremendous political fallout because the groups that are affected will lobby very aggressively against politicians that did this come re-election time. So it's very rare that things like Social Security or interest payments are cut at all. Automatic stabilizers. These are federal expenditures or revenue items that automatically respond counter-cyclically to changes in national income. In other words, when the economy starts to get worse, uh, unemployment and welfare, food stamps increase. And income tax collections decrease because you're making less money in a recession people who are making less money in a recession will pay in a lower tax bracket or not pay income tax at all if they have no income. As economic growth returns, the opposite happens, which puts small, a small restraint on the economic growth. So as things go better, unemployment, welfare, food stamps, uh, those payments will actually start to come back down. Cyclical deficits. Uh, that portion of the budget deficit attributable to short-run changes in economic conditions. So cyclical, the cycl cyclical deficit widens when GDP growth slows or inflation increases, or shrinks when GDP growth accelerates or inflation decreases. In other words, as the economy slows, taxes come down, unemployment benefits rise, and other transfer payments rise. Okay. And so during these cycles, we create additional deficit. We create more, a larger deficit because our taxes go down and our payments go up. Who is to blame for deficit increases? Uh, 
the impact of cyclical components, automatic stabilizers, and policy initiatives affect the budget at the same time. So the CBO is the Congressional Budget Office. This is a nonpartisan uh, group of accountants that work for Congress that doesn't have an affiliation to one party or another. In 2009, the trillion dollar budget deficit increase was due to the recession. So this was, once again, there's a trillion dollar, let's take a step back, a trillion dollar budget deficit increase. The previous deficit was about, oh, three to 400 million, and uh, about 300 million. So by adding a trillion dollars to the deficit in one year in 2009, we tripled what was previously the largest deficit in our history. I mean, that, that's worthy of a pause and a note because we tripled our largest deficit in our history in one year. And about a third of that, actually a little less than a third was due to the recession. The rest of it, 675 billion, more about double. The previous largest deficit ever was just an increase in discretionary fiscal policy. So our government decided to spend a whole bunch of money to try and fend off a deeper depression or recession and by spending a tremendous amount of money. Measuring the impact of fiscal policy. We must focus on changes in the structural deficit, not the total deficit. So the fiscal stimulus is measured by an increase in the structural deficit uh, or shrink in, stru in structural surplus. Fiscal restraint is measured by a decrease in the structural deficit. So once again, when we try to stimulate the economy, uh, we measure, uh, this is measured by an increase in the structural deficit. Economic effects of deficits. First, crowding out. We discussed crowding out in the last chapter, in chapter 11. Crowding out is when the government uh, increases its borrowing, which limits the ability of the general population to borrow money. Anybody who tried to borrow money in 2009, 2010 knows what crowding out is. It was very difficult to get a loan uh, because the banks were tied up in working with the government and by increased uh, restrictions uh, from legislation, specifically Dodd-Frank. Economic effects of deficits. Interest rate movements. So an increase in demand for funds will cause the price of borrowing the interest rate to rise. So the rising interest rates may get more costly for consumers or businesses to borrow and they may cut back. Rising interest rates also increase the borrowing costs of government. Okay, we have to pause here. This would be a market force. The, the government wanting to borrow more money and the private sector wanting to borrow more money in the time for recession will drive interest rates up in a market economy. Remember that the Federal Reserve kept interest rates artificially low and still have them as low as they can go. Banks can essentially borrow money from the Federal Reserve for free, for nothing, for 0% interest right now. And the Fed has, Ben Bernanke has kept interest rates low because he and the Federal Reserve Board can set interest rates. So when the book here talks about interest rates movements, that would be market economy that would drive interest rates up. That didn't happen once again because we, uh, in a sense, set them low. Okay, let's look at this graph of deficit as a percentage of GDP. So you could see that since 1950, uh, our debt to GDP ratio so that would be uh, our total uh, year deficit to GDP ratio, I should say, our yearly deficit as a percentage of our total GDP. So how much money we are short, how much more we spend than we bring in uh, as a percentage of our total GDP, which is about uh, 15 trillion or so. So you could see since 2009 was the peak, but we've been up close to 10% uh, since this Great Recession started. And but prior to that, we had only been over 5% for a very short period of time. Economic effects of surpluses. If the government runs a surplus, that is tax revenues are greater than government expenditures, it's a leakage to the circular flow. It puts a drag on the economy. In other words, if the government is bringing in 
4 trillion a year and spending 3.5 trillion a year. That means it's sucking 5 trillion dollars out of the economy every year that it doesn't need to. Not 5 trillion, 500 million dollars out of the economy every year that it doesn't need to. So in such a case, you would uh, policy would dictate that you would either spend that money, which is what our current government would do, just find a new way to spend it to get it back into the economy. You would cut taxes. That's what George W. Bush did uh, when he took office and inherited a budget surplus. He refunded that money back to the people. Uh, you would do increased income transfers. So you would increase payouts for food stamps, welfare, etc. Or you would pay off old debt. Uh, spending surplus increases the size of the public sector and cutting taxes or increasing income transfers puts money in people's hands and enlarges the private sector. So once again, that's what we talked about in the last slide. We would want to cut tax to get money back out to the people and they would spend the money and move the economy forward even further. Paying off some accumulated debt puts money in the hands of the debt holders. And then those folks, so if we chose to pay, to pay off our debt, we give money to the people who held the debt, they're gonna spend, and that's gonna expand the private sector and once again, grow the economy. And then the, jumping back to the top one, a spending surplus increases the size of the public sector. So if the government were to just spend that money, once again, they're putting the money back in the economy, but it grows government. The accumulation of debt. The national debt is the accumulation of many more years of running budget deficits and surpluses. So the difference between debt and deficit, this is important. The debt is the accumulation or the, the sum of all previous deficits. And the deficit is your yearly loss. So if the government loses, uh, right now we're losing about between one and $1.5 trillion a year, depending on the year. So we'll use 1 trillion as a round number for the sake of the example. If, we're at, if our yearly deficits are 1 trillion, and that means that after 10 years, we would have added 10 trillion to the debt, to the total debt. The US Treasury borrows by issuing treasury bonds to lenders who want a safe investment uh, paying out interest. So wherever, in order to fund that deficit, we sell US Treasury bonds. And then people buy those bonds and then the government pays them back plus interest. In 2011, the national debt was nearing 15 trillion. That is the uh, an average of more than $50,000 for every US citizen. A better indicator is debt to GDP ratio. Debt to GDP ratio is very important. Except for the Civil War, the ratio was, was about 10% from 1790 to 1917. And remember, uh, that's right around the time of income tax, when income tax was put into place. And that's when government spending really started to expo explode. During World War II, it rose to 130%. We had to finance our war effort. And then it came right back down. In 2000, it was about 35%. Our total debt to our GDP, about 35%. And only, this is only in 2000. By 2012, uh, by the last year, it rose above 100%. And we are close to 105% here in 2013. So it's increasing dramatically. Uh, and that's through the spending policies of George W. Bush and Barack Obama uh, and the lack of, in a sense, the lack of fiscal restraint uh, by both of those administrations and both political parties over the last 13 years. Debt since 1900 as a percentage of GDP. So you could see what the graph actually looks like in terms of our spending. And importantly, and once again, World War II, uh, spending got pretty high. The only decreases we see are during the Roaring Twenties, uh, leading, into, leading into the Great Depression. Uh, we were decreasing our percentage of our debt to GDP ratio, and then FDR increased it uh, fairly dramatically, I mean, including the war effort. And then that slowly declined all the way into the early 80s where it started to creep back up, uh, went down with the tech boom and the increased tax revenue from that and Clinton uh, partnering with Gingrich to have a fiscal restraint policy in the late 1990s. Uh, 
uh, stayed increased but stayed relatively stable through the early 2000s and then in the late Bush administration, early Obama administration, it, it skyrocketed with the Great Recession. Uh, the debt to GDP since 1792, you could see we had a little bump for the Civil War. Uh, and then with the when we got income tax put into place after 1900, the government spending kind of went crazy. Even though they had more money, it kind of whetted their appetite for spending. You see it go up there and then we already talked about the rest. Federal plus state debt. Uh, we're at this time, uh, the graph doesn't quite go up to this moment in time. We're as high as we've ever been in our nation's history when you add federal and state debt. Up to now, we've just been talking about federal debt. State debt in 2005 dollars uh, as a percentage of per capita. So you could see that state debt has really increased dramatically. And there really hardly was any state debt earlier. Uh, the, the change you have from 1900 really to 1960 and then what's happened since then are the pension plans. Uh, state, state workers get very large pensions, they get health care, they get uh, health care for their families. Uh, people are living longer so the pensions sometimes are paid longer than the person actually worked and this is growing debt dramatically. And there's no real end in sight to that. That will continue to be a problem as people live longer and longer. And the taxpayers are paying for more and more people in their states that aren't actually working any longer and haven't been for a long time. It's really an unsustainable problem. All the models on which that type of uh, pension and healthcare were built had people dying 10, 15 years younger than they actually are when they promised to pay those, that is when they promised to honor those pensions. They had no idea people would live this long and it's really throwing everything off. So who owns the debt? The national debt creates as much wealth for bondholders as it does liabilities for the treasury. So who owns all of these treasury bonds? Uh, first, federal agencies. Uh, federal Reserve and Social Security Administration hold 40% of all treasury bonds so the, the Federal Reserve, for the most part, buys treasury bonds to help increase uh, our ability to pay debt. State and local governments hold 5%, private sector holds 24%, and foreigners hold the last 31%. Why would you hold a US government debt? It's safe, we always repay. Uh, there's interest paid. It's extremely low right now because we've set all interest rates low. Uh, but at times they can pay very well. They paid extremely well in the in the early 1980s, you know, up to 15% and more uh, per year, which is just a lot of people got rich off that. Uh, and once again, the dollar is the most powerful currency in the world. And to have dollars owed to you plus interest is a very attractive thing for conservative investors. The burden of debt, uh, refinancing, the issue of new debt and payment of debt issues earlier. So when one treasury bond matures, another one has to be sold in order to pay to pay it off. So the, the debt always stays, stays as the debt. There's no addition to the debt, only another deficit adds to the debt. It's a, it's a little confusing, but what happens is that uh, when the government has to pay back a treasury bond, they, we typically borrow money to pay back our debtor. So if I buy a treasury bond in 1980 and in 2010 it comes due, the government doesn't have the cash for that. They have to borrow the money, increase the deficit to pay me back for the money I loaned them in 1980. So it's just this never ending cycle that we're in. Debt service, the interest required to be paid each year on outstanding debt. So increased interest payments use up funds that cannot be used for other government expenses. So the, as time goes on and the larger our debt is, our debt payments will become a larger and larger percentage of what we have to pay, of our expenditures. So our interest expense keeps increasing as our debt increases. It, it's almost as if you had a credit card and you've maxed it out and then you have to pay the minimum on it. 
Well, and in, and so you're paying the interest only, and it's just not, and the principal doesn't really get any smaller, and you're just paying the minimum uh, payment, the interest on it, and you need to spend more so you get another credit card. And then you're paying the interest only on that one. Well, your interest expense is going up so much that you can't pay into the principal on those credit cards, and the debt never seems to go away. Well, that's what's happening with our national debt. Finally, the burden of debt, uh, opportunity cost. The true burden of, of debt is the opportunity cost of the activities financed by the debt. So the opportunity cost is all the things we could have done with the money that we're currently using to pay off our debt. The debt and economic growth. If deficit financed government spending crowds out private investment, future generations will bear some of the debt burden. So what this is basically saying is that when we spend all this money and create these huge deficits they do have to be paid back and many of the people and many of us uh, who are using this debt to finance our own success to finance the country right now and to pay for all this government spending that debt is going to get passed down to future generations and they will have to pay it uh, just like the the debt incurred during World War II had to be paid over the next 20 years really is about how long it took to get by those graphs remember it was a slow decline back down the def, debt to GDP ratio but that was uh, paid down by future by the next generation well we're in, incurring a massive debt right now and that will have to be paid down by future generations repayment if the U.S. Treasury pays off maturing bonds with taxes, it is a redistribution of income from taxpayers to bondholders. So we're simply shifting money from our taxpayers to the people holding the bonds, who are also probably taxpayers. So it's very much a cyclical thing. External debt. Borrowing from foreign, foreigners eliminates crowding out. So we get more public sector goods without cutting back private sector production. So as long as foreigners are willing to buy our debt, it's really a helpful thing. Uh, we want external pe people from other countries to buy our debt. China holds a tremendous amount of our debt right now. That only helps us because we're getting their money into our economy instead of buying our own debt with the, using the Federal Reserve to buy our own debt. So it's a much healthier thing if other people, other countries hold our debt. Deficit and debt limits. The only way to stop the growth of the deficit is to eliminate I'm, I should back up there. The only way to stop the growth of the debt is to eliminate budget deficits. Uh, a, gradual way, a gradual way to do this is to impose a debt ceiling. Uh, so this is something that's being argued about in the press all the time and between the two political parties. And we're only increasing the debt ceiling about a year, year and a half at a time, sometimes less. We have another debt ceiling battle coming up here in 2013 where one party is spending all the money and the other party doesn't want them to spend the money and doesn't want to raise the debt ceiling. Right now it's the Democrats uh, who want to raise the debt ceiling, the Republicans who are resisting. If you go back six, seven years, it was the Republicans who wanted to raise the debt ceiling and the Democrats who were resisting. So whoever's in power wants the debt ceiling higher and whoever is not in power wants to uh, lock in the debt ceiling and force the other party to live within their means. Debt burden over time. So this is an interesting graph, just how much the debt is increasing. Uh, debt per citizen, we're, uh, we're a little over $52,000 per person right now in 2013. The debt per taxpayer is fewer and fewer paying taxes. You see how dramatically that has gone up. Uh, hundred and we're over $142,000 per, per, per taxpayer is the debt owed. All right, that's it for chapter 12. We'll come back for chapter 13.